Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 57th of the COVID Calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at Drexel University in Philadelphia. Today, we launch a weekly set of discussions in partnership with the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University. Our first of these Academy COVID Calls discussions will focus on biodiversity, and I'll introduce you to my guests in just a moment. You can catch COVID calls live every weekday at 5 p.m. Eastern time on YouTube Live. Just go to the COVID calls YouTube channel to watch. You can hear the COVID calls recorded as podcasts on podbean.com or anywhere else where you catch podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID calls. Please do help spread the word and send suggestions for guests and future topics. As of today, June 2nd, 2020, there are 6,325,303 confirmed cases globally of COVID-19, according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. That's up from 6,229,408 cases reported yesterday. 1,820,523 of those are in the United States, up from 1,799,747 reported yesterday. There are now a total of 105,644 deaths reported in the United States, up from 104,702 deaths reported yesterday. As a way to bring humanity to the numbers, I've been reading a life story every day, and I'd like to continue that now. Headline is Ethel S. Barnett Boone, 92, civil rights activist. This appeared in the Philadelphia Tribune, March 26, 2020. Ethel S. Barnett Boone, a civil rights activist and former resident of Philadelphia, died on Friday, March 13, 2020, in Estero, Florida. She was 92. According to her family, Barnett Boone was a tenacious civil rights activist who was graceful, loving, and kind. She forged a path that impacted hundreds of thousands of lives. She helped to plan and participated in the March on Washington with Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., marched on the Edmund Pettus Bridge on Bloody Sunday in Selma, Alabama 55 years ago, lay down in front of buses with C. Dolores Tucker in Philadelphia, was hosed down with water hoses and faced canines as she fought for civil rights. She was a police officer with the Philadelphia Police Department from 1961 to 1971. In 1977, Barnett Boone was appointed by Governor Milton Schapp as the first African-American civil service commissioner for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. As a commissioner, she was an administrative law judge and heard all of the cases involving employees and the state. She was reappointed by both Republican and Democratic governors, eventually retiring as the chair of the commission. Throughout her career, Barnett Boone served on a multitude of governing boards, including the Philadelphia Energy Education Council, the Mayor's Commission for Women in Philadelphia, and the Governor's Study Committee on Employment of the Handicapped. She was the first vice president of the NAACP Philadelphia chapter. Barnett Boone was the recipient of many awards, recognitions, and accolades, including the Humanitarian Award from the NAACP Philadelphia, a resolution by the City of Philadelphia recognizing her as a living legend, and by Governor Tom Wolfe for her exemplary citizenry for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Barnett Boone was also an active member and trustee of Bright Hope Baptist Church in Philadelphia for over 50 years. In lieu of flowers, donations may be sent in her memory to the SW Florida Community Foundation in the name of Ethel Barnett Boone. The funds will be used as part of a grant that promotes diversity, inclusion, tolerance, and social justice. Okay, I'd like to turn to the conversation for today and start by introducing my three guests. Mary Angelis H. Arce is the Ichthyology Collection Manager in the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel University and an adjunct professor in the Biodiversity, Earth, and Environmental Science Department, which has the best acronym of any department anywhere in the United States, BEES, um, the BEES Department, where she teaches global warming, biodiversity, and your future as a class. Dr. Arce obtained her PhD in zoology from the Pontifica 
Universidade Católica de Rio Grande do Sul in Brazil in 2012. Her current research involves several neotropical catfish families, and she's starting to work with environmental DNA as a tool to understand biodiversity of aquatic ecosystems. Rick McCourt has been botany curator at the Academy of Natural Sciences of Drexel since 1997 and a professor in the bees department since the Academy merged with Drexel in 2012. He's currently also director of the Center for Systematic Biology and Evolution. Rick does research on the biodiversity, evolution, ecology, and systematics of green algae, specifically green algae that are among the closest living algal relatives of land plants. He also curates the plant collection of the Lewis and Clark expedition and has written about the history of the botanical results from their journey. My third guest, Jason, Jason Wexstein, is an associate professor in the bees department as well at Drexel University and is associate curator in the Department of Ornithology of the Academy of Natural Sciences. Wexstein is a fellow of the American Ornithological Society and has over 20 years of experience working in natural history museums and has conducted research on birds and their parasites in the United States, Canada, South Africa, Ghana, Malawi, Nicaragua, Brazil, and Mexico. So to all three of you, welcome to COVID Calls. Thanks for having us. <laughs> so I'd like to start yeah. um, the way I, I usually do, which is just finding out uh, where people are and also how they've been doing in this COVID-19 situation. So Rick, let me start with you. Um, where are you calling in from sure. and, and how's it going there? Uh, I'm calling in from Northwest Philadelphia. I'm in Chestnut Hill, right on the border with uh, Mount Airy. And uh, so it's pretty calm up here. Uh, yesterday evening, they did board up about half the storefronts uh, in just in anticipation of trouble, but nothing happened. Um, so it's been fairly, fairly decent here. I haven't been able to go into the academy at all. We're closed down. And so uh, the, the streets are kind of broad and there's a big school near here and a church area and, and stuff like that. So they have a bunch of unoccupied athletic fields. So I go out there with my dog and wander around and uh, social distancing is pretty easy out there. So, yeah. Mary Angela, so, same question to you. Yeah. Uh, I'm in Philly. I'm in Philadelphia as well in uh, by the Army Museum area. So Things here have been a little hectic last couple of days, as you all know, with uh, the protest. And, um, it's, I'm, I'm not in the middle of it, but today they were even uh, on my street. And so I, it's, it's been helicopters constantly uh, in that sense. And then the um, COVID sense has been, uh, I'm lucky enough that I live uh, close to the river and the path, so I can kind of go there. There's a lot of people that have the same idea though. So you have to have protection and uh, keep moving away from people, but uh, but it's still you can have a little bit of uh, outdoor just going out and there. What was your last day at the at the academy? Do you do you remember? Well, my last day, I am uh, I was coming back from maternity leave, ready to work. My last day at the academy was actually in uh, December nineteenth. Okay, so you have been there <laughs> I've been a little while. Really long time outside. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'll ask you in a little bit if you're if you're missing being there, I imagine you are, but Rick, maybe I wanted to ask yeah. you, what was the last day you were there? <laughs> That's yeah. a real good question, because it turns out that it was like January 3rd. Okay. <laughs> I was on sabbatical, I left the country, and I came back on March 11th with a bad cold, probably with a lot of suspicious looks on the airplane, and uh, immediately we shut down after that before I got better enough to go in. <laughs> wow. Jason, let me turn to you. Um, first question is, you know, where, where are you and how's it, how's it going? And then I guess, same question also, what was your last day in the, in the academy? So I'm, I'm in Wynwood, so Lower Marion, and, um, and so far so good here. Um, I live close to a really great park and I'm a crazy bird watcher in addition to being a professional ornithologist. So, um, I've done the same thing as Rick, take the dog out for a walk. I, I hook him up to my belt, put my binoculars on, throw my camera over my shoulder, and I've been doing a lot of bird photography. You know, pretty much every day I get out for a walk, and migration's kind of over now, so um, it's going to be a while before that picks up again, but I'll still be able to get fresh air. Um, and I think the last day, I think it was actually Friday the 13th. I'm, I'm pretty certain that was the date. I think it was Friday the 13th of March. Mm -hmm. And at the last day, I actually had somebody coming in to give a seminar at the museum, a friend of mine who was here at Villanova. 
and we got her to come down to the museum to give a seminar. And this is when everyone started freaking out. And, you know, I was originally going to have her take the train, but I decided that probably wasn't a good idea. And I picked her up at Villanova. We drove into the museum and then that was the last day I was in. Did she give the talk, Jason? She gave the talk, but there wasn't much of an audience. I okay. mean, <laughs> let's just say that, you know, pretty much people were realizing it's not a good idea to be, you know, close to other people and in groups. Yeah. And um, it was kind of the, the end of hugs and, <laughs> and yeah. touching your friends. <laughs> For people yeah. who may not know, the Drexel main campus is in West Philadelphia and the Academy of Natural Sciences is um, more in the center city of Philadelphia on the Ben Franklin Parkway. I teach history. And this term I'm teaching with my colleague, Tiago Sariva, a course on Lewis and Clark and Lewis oh. and Clark expedition. And we're re-examining that expedition. And one of the ways we're re-examining it is botanically. Um, and so, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I always enjoy going over there, but this spring for April and May, we had plans to sort of be real pests over there. Yeah. We'd planned to really kind of take up residence over there. And it's really been, we've missed it. We've missed the opportunity to be in yeah. there with you all. Well, so. next year. <laughs> we'll do it next year. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Rick, let me ask you, it's a little hard to ask anybody to summarize the history of the Academy. Yeah. But, um, could you just hit some of the high points for those who may not be too familiar with this important institution? Uh, sure. Well, the Academy of Natural Sciences has an interesting name. Uh, it was founded a long time ago uh, when natural sciences actually included just about everything about the natural world. and, and Kind of similar today, but that term is not used very often, except maybe in colleges for something. But it was like zoology, botany, mineralogy, geology, astronomy, physics, chemistry. There are probably mixtures of those people, but it started off with seven people who are probably more like collectors of um, animals and plants in 1812. So it's quite a while ago. And they established themselves kind of, uh, Philadelphia was the biggest, best, greatest city in North America. New York wasn't quite there yet, and uh, they wanted. They had a, the American Philosophical Society, which was scientific society, really. And these folks got together, and they wanted to have some collections, and they wanted to establish what they thought would, or they said would be the for the encouragement and cultivation of the sciences and the advancement of useful learning, which is still our mission, our our founding statement today, and it's it describes what we do. So we have a lot of scientists like Jason and Mariana uh, here today, and myself which uh, are curators of uh, various parts of the biota or the animal and plant kingdom. So I do plants, Marianne Hillis does fish, Jason does birds. We have people who study insects, paleontology, diatoms, which are microscopic plants um, and uh, uh, other things like that. And we also have another part of our museum, which is uh, comes from Ruth Patrick's legacy. She was an environmental scientist who lived to be 104. She just died a few years ago. And those are folks who are kind of the, uh, take the ologies as we call them, the ornithology, zoology, uh, and botany, which is not an ology, but uh, take that kind of science and they use it for environmental work. And uh, there are geochemists, stream ecologists, uh, 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 plant assessment people, fishery scientists, computer scientists as well. And so, um, our, our new motto, so to speak, is be a force for nature. And our mission is to uh, advance research, education, and public engagement about biodiversity and science. And we have a long history of, uh, well, in, in light of some comments or conversations we've been having today, a bunch of old dead white males, plus Ruth Patrick, uh, have been very eminent scientists there uh, over the past years. Lighty was a, a Penn uh, professor, but he also worked at the Academy of Natural Sciences. Uh, Cope, um, James Bond, an ornithologist. Maybe Jason will tell you about our connection to the real James Bond. Um, so we have uh, an amazing history of scientists who've worked at the place and still do now, those of us who are alive. And um, so it's a, quite a legacy, but uh, an interesting place to work. We have 18 million specimens, uh, which have scientific uses today we can get into later. And uh, you know they're more than just dead things in a cabinet. And uh, we study basically the diversity of the natural world. 18 million to me sounds like a lot. <laughs> it is, yeah. Like it if is I said, I have a library of 18 million books, that would be pretty impressive to people. How yeah. does that stack up to other uh, sort of institutions that collect? Um, I think we're about number nine. We're in the top 10, I think, 
and correct me if right, Marianne Hoss and Jason, about in the top 10, but it's a it's an exponential curve, I think, in a sense. Uh, the biggest ones are the Smithsonian Natural National Museum of Natural History, which has probably tens of uh, hundreds of millions. Uh, other places have you know there's eight million plants up at the National uh, at the New York Botanic Garden, which is much bigger than our collection. Um, the uh, I have Jason and you and Marianne Hills. Maybe you can comment on where the biggest collections are. Uh, yeah, I think if you here, look at the, at the things as a per, per collection, we have like different rankings. Like if we look at the fish, we are among the fifth largest. Uh, if you look at malacology, I think they are the largest or the second largest in the world. Mm -hmm. so, in or ornithology, okay. Sorry, or ornithology, we're like, um, if, if you look at university based collections, we're second largest, so we're second to Harvard. But collections like the Field Museum, American Museum, British Museum, those are those are bigger than ours. Our, our bird collection is about a quarter of a million specimens, yeah. And so, uh, so it's quite a few sometimes. It, when you count all the diatoms, they'll fit into a couple of cabinets and there are millions of specimens. Well, we don't count all those as one each, but but you can count them as lots and b batches, you know, so you may have 400 guppies, so to speak, <laughs> and that'll be one unit, you know, so uh, <laughs> it, it can be counted in various ways. And then we'll have a, a whale skull and that's one as well. So. Well, we'll come to the to pandemic in a minute, but just, just for a second, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask Rick. Um, so you, you have a big role to play also in the, the keeping of the herbarium, the Lewis and Clark uh -huh. herbarium. And could you just say a bit about the about that collection, the significance of that collection for people who may not be aware? They don't usually sure. think of Lewis and Clark, they think of St. Louis, they don't think of Philadelphia, but the Academy has an important That's role true. to play there. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I was, I've been writing a book on this now, so I'll keep it real short. <laughs> but uh, the uh, at the time, Philadelphia was, as, as I said, the center of science and actually until 1800, it was the center of government too. The White House was here, or not the White House, but the government was here. And so um, this was the place to be for science. But Jefferson, uh, when he took office 1800, was down in uh, District of Columbia. He recruited Meriwether Lewis, who was a military guy to collect, to take the journey with William Clark recruited later. But Lewis was not a technical scientist. So he sent him here for a crash course, like you'd send an astronaut a jet fighter pilot in the in the right stuff days and you'd send them to learn the basics of physics and stuff like this or that they might not know to do some experiments so he studied with experts in paleontology uh, uh, medicine geology celestial navigation and then botany with uh, one of the foremost botanists of the time benjamin smith barton he learned how to collect plants and jefferson gave a detailed set of instructions to him uh, saying this is what you're going to do find a first of all find a water route to the west which they did but it wasn't very short and very easy so um instead they also uh, collected a few birds which still exist today two specimens i think um they collected some mammal skins which don't uh, exist and they collected over 200 plant specimens which have been preserved over time so they brought them back here Lewis was not quite equipped to write them up for the technical publication so he handed them off to a fellow named uh, Frederick Persh, who did that, and Lewis, of course, committed suicide in 1809, long before anything was ever published about the plants. He probably died thinking he was a failure about that, although he had other problems that caused it. Not it wasn't a disappointed botanist. So um, the uh, plants were written up in 1813, but kind of remained a bit in obscurity for about 100 years or so till they were all gathered together at the academy, and we keep them in the uh, climate controlled cabinets and people still come and look at them because there's about 85 to 90 of them that are what we call the type specimens that is scientific names are based on those specimens we have because they were new to science when Lewis collected them so we still keep them for that reason and they actually can be analyzed if you have a good enough reason to take a minuscule sample to look at uh, DNA or chemistry or some other things we don't do it very often well, thank you for that. It's sure. really remarkable. We're going to be talking about biodiversity today, but also to understand the sort of historical uh, lens on biodiversity. And, and right. It's really fascinating to imagine um, you know, the collecting of those of those plants and the fact that they are mm -hmm. there all in, in, a, in one place. Yeah, and that's part of what we do. There's this legacy you have of, you know, you can have a list of species that some explorer saw, or he says, I saw a big thing that was, looked like a whale, you know, that doesn't mean as anything in a scientific sense 
technically, but if you have a specimen, you can actually go to it and see it and you, you can verify what the flora was like 200 years ago, 150 years ago, and maybe all the way up to present day. And you can document changes in time uh, of the landscape. And that's partly why we don't just look at them once, photograph them and throw them away, you know. Right, right. So Jason, let me um, ask you, you mentioned you were out and about uh, photographing birds. And uh, one of the things people have pointed out in this uh, tragic and very strange time in which we find ourselves is the surprising um, emergence of biodiversity all around them. And I wonder if you could tell us a little of your experience, but also why, why is this happening? Yeah, so I think for the most part, there isn't really any more of an emergence of wildlife. I think it's people out there noticing it. I think most of us live our lives rushing to the train, rushing to the office, you know, we don't take sort of these mindful, relaxing walks every day. Um, you know, we'd like to, but but most of us don't find the time because it's, you know, we're, we're, life is just too hectic. But now that we're all stuck at home, we all find a little bit of time each day to get outside and get a little fresh air somehow. And, and even I'm seeing a lot more birds in my park than I normally do just because I'm there every single day. You know, I'm there on the good days and the bad days. So I had some epic days where, you know, in my little teeny park, I saw over 50 species of birds, you know? Um, and and I, I think this spring, I forget exactly what the numbers are, but um, we've seen, you know, this sort of set of us that sort of socially distance walks the park um, at times. Um, we've seen over a hundred species of birds in the park this spring. You know, we're in the double digits for numbers of bald eagles in this little suburban park. Um, lots of other cool things too. Two species of owls. And, more birds. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you're right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the wind. Actually, I heard a, I heard a bird out your window, Scott, a, a little while ago. I heard a, I heard a downy oh, woodpecker good. calling. <laughs> you're very good. <laughs> I'm in New Jersey, Jason. You're the here yeah. identifying. Um, yeah. Uh, Add that to your yard list. <laughs> but I had a I had assumed that it was because of, and maybe both could be true. But I had assumed it was because of decreasing traffic. Um, that maybe there were actually you know, species, animal species have becoming more evident where they wouldn't have been before, but you're actually describing our powers of observation have increased potentially. Yeah, I, I think just because we're out there more, I mean, in fact, like my mm -hmm. local park, I think the traffic has increased. So I'm seeing kids, you know, kids in the creek and, you know, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Instead of being stuck in school all day, they're actually out in nature, splashing around, getting muddy with their parents out in the creek. Um, and, you know, so it should actually be scaring the birds away. Um, in fact, that's how we found sort of a new, a new bird that we had never seen in the park, this thing called a solitary sandpiper. Some kids were walking around the creek and we saw the thing fly up and then ran down to the edge of the creek and there was this sandpiper. Um, you know, so, so I think there are actually more people outside in some of these areas than, than on a normal weekday. I think that it's, a, it's sort of, uh enhanced exposure or awareness of biodiversity actually leads to stronger environmental commitments. Uh, people sort of feel a stronger connection somehow to the environment or even a more political ambition. To I, I, I hope so. I, I mean, I mean, I'm already seeing, you know, like it, in this local park, you know, for example, there's, there's a little girl that lives across the street with her parents and she started walking around with binoculars and this group of us saw her and we, you know, she started talking with us about birds. She, they put a sign up on their front sure. lawn with a list of all the birds that she had seen in the park. And, um, and there are other people showing up, you know, they're basically we're posting our bird list to a citizen science database called eBird and other people are finding out about it. And then on, on, there's a Facebook group called the Lower Marion Community Network and there's a photographer that, photographs birds in the area and he comes to the park and he posted some pictures of some little baby screech owls that we found. And then people started coming to the park to look for the screech owls. So there's sort of this, I mean, in a way it's a growing appreciation for the nature that we have all around our houses. And uh, it's good that people are seeing it and appreciating it and valuing these natural areas that we have. Very good. Let me come to you. Um, and maybe you could tell us a little bit of the other side of the story. I mean, we're hearing a little bit about things that might not have been so obvious to us, the diversity around us, but what are some of the risks to biodiversity in this time? Well, I think um, something that we have been seeing in certain areas is, um, and I'm gonna talk about areas in South America, like uh, Brazil and Colombia. Um, I think in areas uh, of the, in the rainforest, in the Amazon, we're seeing that 
there is a little bit of um, lack of vigilance over the forest, I will say. So last year in Brazil, if you probably all remember, there was this um, whole thing about the forest fires that were basically a, a consequence of the lack of the government ruling on these lands. And so this is, this is a continuous uh, trend and it's happening even more uh, now in Brazil. Um, I know that in Colombia, there has been about like 75,000 uh, hectares of, of forest already this year being destroyed. And it's for two reasons. One, because there is, um, everybody is, is so looking into the crisis, which is of course the most important thing right now, but they are just not looking into what's happening uh in terms of of uh other things like like deforestation but also because in a lot of these lands the people that protect the forest are the indigenous people that are also concerned about their risk of of uh contracting the the disease just because in areas like leticia which is the town in the in the colombian portion of the amazon they don't even have an icu so if anybody gets sick it's really not much it can be done. So people is being really careful and they are not out to take care of these areas. And I know that in certain areas of Africa, there was some fear about uh, the pouching and in increasing just because the same reason there is no vigilance, but also because this is these are areas where the food is scarce uh, normally and these times are even harder for people to get their food. So they're just pouching for meat, basically. So these are things we are all uh, looking at this one crisis, which is huge, but we do have a big crisis uh, on the biodiversity side as well, I think. Jason, did you want to add anything to that or anything else that's on your mind about concern? Yeah, about I mean, places like, like Amazonia are, they're, they're, you know, they, they, you know, we call like Amazonia the lungs of the earth, right? This is a gigantic forest ecosystem. It's the, it's the largest and most diverse tropical ecosystem on the entire planet, tropical wilderness ecosystem. And parts of it are pretty hacked apart, unfortunately, at this point. Um, and parts of it are pristine and large and still intact. Um, and it's not uniform. So it's not just, you, you can't just protect a little corner of it and then hope you're protecting all the biodiversity. There's biodiversity that's endemic to different regions. So we have to pay attention to those places that have a lot of habitat destruction. So this is really the Southern and Eastern parts of Amazonia have the most destruction. And the, the statistics are kind of like, uh, if we, we're, we're basically at like 17% destruction of Amazonia at this point. And if it gets to 25 or 30% destruction, we're past a tipping point where, um, where there are gonna be huge climatic impacts potentially and um, you know, the, the, the forest itself creates its own humidity. You know, there's all this transpiration and, um, and it processes all kinds of water. Um, and, you know, it, it produces services for us, for the whole planet, right? So it's an important place to preserve. Um, so I think the fact that sort of our eye is off the ball, I mean, it, there, there are political issues too um, that are mixed up in a lot of this. The, the current administration in Brazil is not very friendly to environmentalism, much like our own administration is not very friendly to that. And, um, and it's very agriculturalist friendly. So basically it's, this is encouraging sort of lawless destruction. There are actually laws in the Brazilian, um, there's, there's Brazilian law that basically requires ranches to keep a certain percentage of forest intact on land but that's not being carefully kept in check right now, unfortunately. Well, that, that perspective is it. Go ahead, please. Sorry, if I might say also in places, in certain places, they are actually trying in, and this is particularly in Colombia, to, to pass new rules in terms of like mine, mining, for example, because everybody is looking the other way. So let's pass a lot of laws so we can, we can keep uh, uh, obtaining economic resources and then at, at the cost of the environment. So that was the, the, what I wanted to ask you about, because I mean, on the one hand, you're describing a situation where there may be places in, in, in South America where it actually falls to local people to protect the forest. But then there's also this sort of policy dimension. 
in which you also need people to be advocating in, in other ways. And they may also not be able to come out for whatever reason, if they're still sheltering. I'm also worried about the, the long economic tail of this. Obviously, the, at some point, and I think we're close to it, the, the pandemic and the economic downturn are indistinguishable. And so the pressure, and we've already seen this very early with the Environmental Protection Agency uh, rolling back certain air quality standards in the United States, there will be strong pressure in places like Brazil, United States, Australia, um, to pull back on environmental regulation. And in the name of, of dealing with the economic distress that we're facing right now. I, Rick, let me bring that to you because I know you've been thinking about sort of the energy consumption dimensions of this. What do you think? Um, yeah, that that is interesting. Um, there are, I, I was making a checklist and, and I was I was expecting that uh, there would be a lot of pluses, but and there were, but there's a lot of minuses too. <laughs> and so it depends on how you look at it. I mean, and in each case, it's kind of a, a, a plus minus for every consideration in a sense. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, the, the list I made was I, about the sort of the plus side, you know, decreased air pollution, which means a healthier environment in general for, for everything, including us. Uh, less carbon dioxide. So there's at least a blip in the greenhouse emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so that's a slight respite, but probably not one that has a major effect from what I've read. Um, you know, there's less noise in the air and the water, actually. So we were talking about the birds that can actually communicate better. Is that right, Jason? They, uh, depending on, it may be worse for predators because of the warning calls can be heard by the little blocks of things that can elude them more easily. But, um, and, but whales and things like that, you know, some sound pollution in the ocean too. Um, so, uh, there's a lot fewer road kills. That is a, it's an upside of things, so the, of less transport and uh, things like that. Um, and uh, actually, there's less potential. Well, it, this is <clears throat> there's a lot of uh, caveats to this, but it could be less potential for some zoonotic diseases like coronavirus, which leaps from uh, an animal to a human uh, host, because the, in some cases there could be less poaching, less markets, and less just spreading that around. On the other hand, I think Marie and Angel has mentioned, there's less enforcement, so there could be more poaching for some things than others. Um, and there's more single-use plastic around in the environment. There's all this stuff. But in terms of energy consumption, I guess, and this is an unanswerable thing, it's an intangible thing. Um, it's like, it, are these behaviors that we're enforced on us gonna be persistent? Are they learned behaviors where we go, oh, this is a good idea? Um, probably. Probably not in some ways, because um, there will be a lot of reasons to get back to work and with a vengeance in a sense. And in some ways, especially here in Philadelphia, uh, there will be an aversion to mass transportation. So that's like a real flip side of, of the whole thing. Um, so that'll be very difficult. But then on the other hand, that's that's life as we know it. There may be other innovations to get around this and we'll have to work through them. But um, in, a, in a sense, it's like been a stress test for us, uh, the COVID experience as a precursor to what we might be experienced with the climate change. Uh, it's a really global issue. It's a global scope, which is unusual. I mean, usually you can think, oh, I guess I'm not gonna go there for vacation because there's a hurricane. But now you can't go anywhere because of COVID. Uh, and so it's global in scope. It's completely beyond anyone's experience and it's incredibly fast. So we've sort of coped, but not very well, especially in this country. So we've failed the stress test a bit, but I'm, maybe that'll prepare us for coping in the future. I don't know. I don't, that's, a, to me, an extremely provocative and important discussion to be having in this moment. And I don't think anybody, no one, would say we should have a pandemic in order to see what may be possible in terms of collective action. I've been deeply impressed just by the collective action um, in this. I know we're sort of people are coming out of shelter now, but if you told me at the beginning of the year that a good chunk of the world's population would follow the advice of scientists and stay indoors for and disrupt their whole lives, I wouldn't have believed that, particularly after coming out of, you know, the United States pulling out of the Paris Accords and things like that. Um, so I, I guess I'll turn to you, Mary Ann Hillis, let me ask you first. I mean, what do you, what kind of lessons, you know, Rick, brought this into sort of the climate action discussion. What kind of lessons are you drawing right now? What kind of things are on your mind as we think about climate change and the pandemic? 
Oh, oh, you're muted. <laughs> I just need to unmute. No, it's fine. Thank you. <laughs> so I think, um, we, as Rick mentioned, we have seen a huge, I mean, this all came in the wrong way, but we saw a huge decrease in emissions. We are seeing like an 8% decrease in emissions, uh, greenhouse gases. And that's about what we will need to have decreased, or the decrease that we need for the next, uh, 10 years if we want to meet the um, goals of the Paris Agreement. So this was all in the like a real crisis at a cost that we don't need. But this, I think, let us think about that we can do it. I think it brings us a little bit of hope in terms of there is, if we follow the advice of scientists, as you, as you mentioned, we could uh, as a collective, we could lower the emissions for real and not just because of this uh, situation. And I think if we if we keep up this work, it will be, I think a lot of uh, governments are thinking on, in terms of like changing ways of transportation. There are certain cities here that are talking about uh, becoming more bike friendly and, uh, and people is gonna be afraid, I think, of for a long time of uh, taking mass transportation. So maybe a lot of people is gonna move into that or we could go into the other end, which is like a lot of people is just gonna use their car more. So it's it's a little difficult to, to predict where we're going. Um, but I think this just shows us that we can do it. Um, one of the main, I think, uh, sources of uh, greenhouse gases is transportation and not just like local transportation, but flights. And so that has stopped immensely so that's why i think we're seeing such a such a reduction and so that i think is in, in a really bizarre way and, and not ideal it may be making people more aware of what we could do and how we can change um if the, this this whole pattern that we have been having for so long jason can i invite you to to share your thoughts on yeah, that. Yeah, I think one of the things that you just brought up is pretty interesting to think about, and that's that, you know, there's been sort of, I don't know, I don't know if you'd call it an era, but a time period of a lot of anti-science behavior in our country, around the world, um, anything, any, everything from anti-vaccination to anti-climate change, not believing scientists that are producing data showing that we have a big problem with climate change. Um, and that, that if we don't pay attention, we're going to end up having, you know, another, another issue like this pandemic, but due to, due to climate change. Um, bottom line is, I think this pandemic will hopefully show people that, that science actually can solve problems, you know, that science, you know, there, there are scientists out there that are heroes working in their labs, trying to come up with solutions that are going to save lives and bring us back out of our houses again, ultimately. And hopefully that spreads out to some of these other problems as well, and that we can actually start applying science again to answer questions and to guide our policies. I, I, I'm really moved by that. I think that's, a, that's an important point to make, and I just you know, speak for myself. I would say um, at this time two years ago, I had never heard, I had, may have heard Anthony Fauci's name, but it's been a while, um, and I had not heard Greta Thunberg's name. And these are two people who now are just important leaders in science or advocating for science who are part of the discussion. So I'm, I'm glad we're having the discussion in this way that we can sort of see, as Rick said, um, you know, a global stress test, a rehearsal in a sense, truly a planetary phenomenon. We don't usually think of disasters in that way. But then these other um, possibilities that seem to be the opening. I think that's really important. Let me remind everyone that you're listening to COVID calls and today we're and the first of our Academy of Natural Sciences and COVID Calls collaboration discussions. And we'll be doing that every Tuesday throughout the month of June. And we have five of these. I'm really glad to have this time together. And I would like to, um, Jason, let, let me, um, actually, let me come back to you for a second here. And then I want to get everyone's perspective on, on this. Can you tell me a, a little bit about, um, how biodiversity science may be connected with the pandemic. For example, understanding the behavior of viruses as they move from non-human. Yeah, to so human. 
one one of the big things that we do at the academy is we study evolutionary biology of organisms. We we build genealogies of life. So we we use DNA sequences to figure out how different species are related to each other, to understand how their traits evolve over time. Well, this is what's been done with this virus. So basically very quickly when the virus arose, scientists started sequencing the genome. So we're, we're at this scale now, you know, when I was a graduate student, I was sequencing small fragments of DNA and working really hard and taking years to do it. But now we can throw the DNA into a next gen sequencer and get the entire genome out of it. Um, and this is what they did with the virus. They, they sequenced all the RNA, which is similar to DNA. It's basically the, the code of life for these viruses and allows them to replicate in a host. And, um, and they, so they sequenced the entire genomes and then were able to build these genealogies and compare them with other coronaviruses. So this is how they figured out this is a coronavirus. This is how it's related to all these other ones. And basically what they were able to figure out is that it likely came from a bat ultimately. So it, it came from some sort of contact that a human had with a bat, whether that was bat feces, bat urine, bat guts, if it was a, a bat that was butchered in one of these wet markets. The bottom line is that contact is what brought it into, um, into the human population. And then because of the, um, the genetic makeup of this virus, it was able to replicate in humans and transmit. That was the key thing, transmit between humans. And um, so that basically the work that we do in biodiversity collections is very much like this kind of work, building genealogies of life. And the other thing Very about this is that, you can, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna no, say go ahead, uh, go using the same kind of techniques that uh, people studied the AIDS virus the same way. You, you get the sequences and you, and you not only can find out where it came from, but you can actually uh, trace it back in space and time. Uh, I think Jason mentioned something like this, but so that we know that probably there was a, a, a bunch of a, a viral uh, transmit transmission from Europe to here on the East Coast and probably from China on the West Coast. So it wasn't just one evil uh, Chinese traveler or whatever. Yeah, what's, re what's really interesting <laughs> is from these genome sequences. Like, well, that's important you, politically, right? I mean, that's just, that's where yeah. the sort of political and scientific dimensions are absolutely interlaced. Sorry, Jason, go ahead. Mm -hmm. so, so from these genome sequences, you can build these genealogies and over time they were adding more sequences and you could see basically, what we, it, we call it biogeographic <laughs> transmission, like basically the movement across different geographic areas. So you could see the, the virus came multiple times in North America and you could see these, these transitions across the world like that. It's, it's really like the first time you could watch this kind of live, the reconstruction of this, of this really rapid evolutionary history of this virus. I was gonna, Marianne Hillis, I was gonna bring you in because we have a question here from Allison Starr. So get your perspective on what we've just been talking about, but she's also wondering if you could talk a little bit about what environmental DNA means. Yes, uh, so basically uh, the environmental DNA refers to every trace of um, DNA that you could find in the environment, as it, it said. So basically what you do is you, instead of uh, going, what we do right now is going to the specimens that we have and we take tissue samples, blood samples, and with that, we obtain DNA and we sequence uh, different genes or as uh, Jason said, the uh, whole genome. But with environmental DNA, you take uh, samples from the environment to try to um, inventory or to try to understand what's living in a specific environment. So if, if you're talking about, this started, I don't know, 30 years ago, um, with uh, soil samples. At this point, it has been moving a lot farther than that. It was specific uh, to just detection of certain species, knowing if they were in a place or not. But now, now we are moving into taking a sample of water and being able to sequence everything that is in there and creating a list of all the organisms that are living in that water or that have used the resource, at least, within a limited frame, uh, temp time frame. Is the interaction between public health and biodiversity science robust? I mean, what you're, what you're all describing to me is just absolutely sort of mind-blowing and not the way I'd really thought about um, how surveillance might work for a pandemic. It, are you in constant conversation with public health researchers and epidemiologists? I mean, um, I'm not, oh, go for it. <laughs> no, you're, you're closer. I, I study plants and they're not so far transmitting any diseases to us, but, um, my Jason uh, does work with birds and we you know, bird flu, you know, some years ago is in the news. So uh, there are. Yeah. So what's cool, what's cool is, well, so my, my research program does focus on 
basically coevolution of birds and parasites and their pathogens. So one of the groups that we study is, um, is malarial parasites. So actually the birds all around us, that woodpecker that was in your backyard, there's a very good chance it carries a malarial parasite or a close relative of malarial parasites. So there are three different sort of kinds of malarial parasites that we find in our local birds. So we're doing a bunch of projects looking at kind of the evolutionary biology, ecology, and epidemiology of these parasites, trying to understand um, what allows them to move around, whether they're specific to particular hosts. And it's very much basic science focused on understanding the evolution and ecology of these parasites. But these were originally models for even studying human malaria. So birds do carry plasmodium, which is the genus of malaria that causes, uh, the, the genus of parasite that causes malaria in humans, but they're different species. So um, the bottom line is we're, you know, we do study that kind of, um, that kind of stuff, but um, in terms of things that affect humans, um, the collections that we have are, we harbor frozen tissue collections, and these could be used to prospect for uh, pathogens like this. Um, so for example, like Rick mentioned avian flu, we have liver samples from birds that we keep frozen at minus 80 degrees, and those could be prospected for, for things like this. And I think natural history collections are sort of rich with this kind of information, is that being taken advantage of fully? Probably not. Um, there are some collaborations that some of my colleagues are, are conducting that are involved with that kind of work, but um, we're not doing it as broadly as we could. But just to stay with you for a second, Jason, you use the term prospecting using the liver for a bird tissue sample. Can you just say, I'm a historian, so go a little slow with me here, but let's, what, do you, what do you mean when you, when you say that? So, um, so you have a tissue sample. Um, so it's a little, little chunk of liver tissue and we can extract DNA or RNA, um, the sort of two pieces of, of the code for life. Uh, and we can, we can actually see what that DNA or RNA is. Is it, um, you know, there's gonna be DNA from the host and there's gonna be DNA from the parasites that are in there. So like we may take a blood sample, that blood sample might have Three different kinds of malaria in it. It might have a trypanosome. So if, you, if you've heard of like sleeping sickness, it's um it's caused by a small little protozoan creature that um, that lives inside of a reduvid, which is a bug that bites. It bite it would bite a person to suck their blood, but it poops on you, and then basically you pick up this this pathogen that way. Um, it turns out that birds carry all kinds of different trypanosomes too. So my postdoc is actually he's looked at. Um, at RNA sequences from birds, and then pull the trypanosome RNA out of those to figure out what trypanosomes are found in some of these birds, for example. So we can we can we can basically use really interesting technology to try and figure out what's in in these things, what's on these things, and we also use traditional approaches. So we make microscope slides and look at those microscope slides and find the parasites in the blood of the of the of the specimens. And those are sort of ancillary materials that are curated with our bird specimens as well. So we have the, the bird specimen, the blood that's frozen, and then we have a microscope slide. So we can study these things in multiple dimensions. Oh, thank you for that, for that description and, and that explaining it in that way. We had a guest on a few weeks ago on COVID calls, a historian named Monica Green, who um, works, she writes about the Black Death. And she's talking about research now in which they're, um, you know, they've been excavating, they had excavated um, bones in London, um, you know, so 14th century plague. Um, and, and there were multiple plagues over, over a long period of time. And it turns out that people who died, um, whose bones were here actually had died in these many different multiple plagues because they're able to now use DNA evidence to begin to tell the story of where the plague was and when. And she she discovered an important historical correction, which is that um, the Black Death, which ravaged Europe in the 14th century was also in places that people hadn't realized it was. For example, like East Africa, it just changes the way we think about trade routes, changes the way we think about travel. Mm -hmm. It also changes the way we think about how we tell the history of pandemics. And yeah. this, that's, that's focused on human transmission, obviously, but it's what you're all talking about has me thinking in this way. Yeah, I mean, one of our own local diseases, Lyme disease. I mean, it was discovered in the 70s because, you know, somebody got sick and eventually they sort of, you know, doctors put two and two together and figured out that it was likely a bacterial infection. And, and then eventually they isolated it and figured out what it was. 
it's been here, right? It was here before people got it. It was in ticks. And, um, and you can go back to old museum collections and find that bacteria in ticks um, if they're preserved properly. And, um, and the reality is it's environmental change that probably led that thing to sort of expand out. And, and there are all kinds of ideas about the kind of environmental change that has led to that. But biodiversity is tied to that. In more biodiverse forest plots, um, you have less Lyme disease than, where, than in plots that are less biodiverse and patchier. So um, we know that biodiversity does affect how these pathogens are, you know, able to sort of come out and affect us as well. Yeah. I, want to remind I seem to that. remember hearing that one of the plagues was not caused by rats. It was some other more innocuous kind of rodent. Uh, and, but, you know, so you can overturn longstanding uh, cliches. Right. Yeah. And, and uh, I guess, you know, it again speaks to the importance of just the nature of this conversation about um, people understanding the, the value of collecting the value of a long-term commitment, I guess, over time mm -hmm. to scientific institutions like the Academy and that, you know, in our hurry up society right now, even though we've slowed down a bit, we do still have this sense that those answers are immediate. They're out there. We grab them. We get what we need from nature in the moment. And you're telling a very different story right now. I just want to remind people you're listening to COVID calls and you can still get questions in. You can get questions in on YouTube live, or you can put questions up on Twitter if you would like to, we've got about 10 minutes left in our conversation here. And I wanna, I wanna ask you, I've been asking social scientists this question, um, how are you doing your work at this time? And often the answer is, um, you know, we have, we have our books and Zoom is working fine for us. A little trouble doing our interviews here and there, but um, and some people have field work and it's really slowed them down. But when I think of the kind of work you all do, it's hard for me to imagine how you're, going to get it done. Mary Angelis, let me turn to you first. Um, you work on fish, right? Yes. Well, you can't do that from your apartment no. in Philadelphia. <laughs> well, I, I kind of can because we have... Uh, with More surprises. <laughs> yes. <laughs> with technology, we are able to access all of our databases. Everything that we have in the collections uh, and all of them is digitized and database. And so we have some sort of access to those. And we have been gathering for a long time that we could use uh, currently for a lot of uh, uh, different types of research. And I'm personally working um, in like two fronts. I'm, I'm working with, uh, or three, I should say, with, work, with the database, like curating a little bit of the database, making it better, including data that we have kind of like the back burner for a long time. Um, on the other side, I've been working on my own research that I've been putting uh, just to wait a little bit because there is a lot of active work in the academy and the loans and the collections. And on the other side, I've been teaching uh, remotely as well. So I've been I've been busier than ever, actually. Since <laughs> 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 started. And here I was. I thought you were going to get a respite from the field, and you're telling me no, you're very diligent about digitizing everything ahead of time. Rick, how is your work changing right now? Um, well, I was. I was thinking what there are various parts to the workflow pipeline. And one of them is sort of reading and preparing and developing ideas, then uh, designing the experiments, collecting the data, analyzing the data and writing it up. And so you can do the first part so I can write proposals. I can't collect the data right now, but I, and I can't collect organisms, but I can analyze the data and I can write it up. So at any given moment, you've got this uh, like a uh, different uh, pigs going through the python, <laughs> you know, <laughs> digesting, I guess, sorry, my dog's visiting me. And um, so I can do a couple of those, but you do end up uh, kind of being stuck after a while. However, we have a lot of digitizing projects too. And so um, so we're actually transcribing those. We're trying to figure out a way to get people interested in it like a game, uh, because people have done that with some Walt Whitman's po pro uh, program, Sally Ride's uh, uh, papers and so forth, but people can see online pictures of plant specimens with labels and they can help enter the data because that's a real bottleneck for us. But mm -hmm. uh, so we, we have some volunteers doing that. We have students doing it as well. And you can do that anywhere in the world as long as you have an internet connection. What you just described, of course, connects to the educational mission, mission of the academy. Mm -hmm. And I guess I should have said at the top that for people who um, grew up or have lived in the Delaware Valley, they often was say that their first experience with science 
um, before they even maybe started school was at the Academy of Natural Sciences. How are you able to do your, accomplish your, your public education mission right now? Rick, let me just stay with you on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably be brief because I mean, these other folks have done it as well. But yeah. <laughs> I think we're doing more now than we did before. It's, no it's all we have figured out the tele zoom, uh, the tele uh, conferencing and zooming of, uh, of the world. And so we have meetings now, which might have drawn a, an audience of 20 or 30 people. They're drawing 40 or more, 50, really? 60, you know, and people can come from all over. So we've done programs to uh, talk to kids. I haven't done that one, but. Um, I've had uh, chats with different people. Maria Nellis had a, a, a session where she told about her career, Shaker of Science. It was a Friday evening, so people could bring their own, uh, bring their own cocktail or a drink. And uh, you can tell about that, Maria. And I'll let's tell, tell it. It was a very innovative Shaker, program. Shaker yeah, Science. Yeah. Of science. So Shaker of Science. It was interesting, just about, just it was a, like a relaxing uh, uh, experience just to talk about how we got to do what we do and things like that. But we also did, I, I was also part of something called the conversations at the Academy that we have. And so that's basically, uh, we have the whole, uh, it was a series of three different uh, um, talks or conversations around the COVID topic. And so it was just to, as, as Rick said, these events are, we're seeing much more people attending just because a lot of people is at home and they can come from anywhere in the world. You don't need them to be physically here. So it, we have, we're reaching more people next the next week i'm doing the one with the kids too we're trying to help like educate the kids on all these subjects as well so yeah we are we are trying to keep keep up with that because it's important and in, and i think in this uh particular times where people is like unease about um what's happening the environment the biodiversity mm -hmm. and things like that it's important to keep, keep on the the message mm -hmm. and i think people too are looking for something to do you know like on, on one of the programs that we did, we, we sort of did a bird program. We talked about, you know, how to get out birding and, you know, sort of how you would go about learning about birds. And we talked about some local birds and talked about our Vireo um, bird, bird image collection. And um, I think we had like 120 people on that Zoom. There were like 65 on Facebook Live. And then there, there were like thousands of, of um, views on, on Facebook after that. You know, so it, it really is reaching a lot more people than we normally do face to face at the museum. So it's cool that we're sort of getting good practice at doing that. It's something that we can continue even when, mm -hmm. when ultimately this is over, we can take advantage of that. Um, yeah. And and there, I mean, you know, it, there were you know grandmothers and their grandkids and parents and their kids and the kids were asking questions and adults were asking questions. It was you know a lot of good engagement. What about you know thinking about the next generation of? I mean. You're, Everything you're describing sounds tremendous to me. At the same time, I have some worries right now about this sort of next generation of scientists. I mean, this is going to be more than just a few months. You know, the disruption to the scientific, um, you know, the supply chain and uh, all of the things we need to do our work and and the facilities that we ultimately need to get to and we do need to get back to the field at some point. And Rick, let me start with you and get everybody's perspective on this. You know, what what can scientists like yourselves right now be doing to support, to be thinking about, you know, the, the impacts this may be having on younger scientists coming up, high school, college age, maybe? Yeah, um, I, I thought about this some and only to the ex extent that uh, I think it uh, makes me feel that we need to be aware of all this stuff. So the job market for everything now is pretty bad, right? There's more people out of and out of a job since the Great Depression. And so uh, some of those are going to be environmental scientists or uh, maybe future environmental scientists for a few years. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. At the Academy, what we can do, uh, and I think you know, my wife points this out, she, she says, you know, Drexel is really pretty well positioned with its co-op program to provide opportunities to students to do things and to make a meaningful contribution. And maybe you know, it's like bridge activities to the next to the next world. Um, beyond that, I mean, you can only do that for so long and with so much funding. But we do have opportunities for that. And uh, but whatever you may think of the Green New Deal, there's certainly parts of that which you could say, "Gosh, that this is we really need." We're talking about an infrastructure program. Both parties. Um, we should make sure that the environment is part of that. And so we're not just building concrete uh, towers to the sky, but we can 
you know, do work projects of America did more than just building bridges. They helped also restore things in the environment. And so there are creative ways to attack this and say, yes, we can have jobs for people to do this. And there are things to be done in the natural world to help restore, conserve, and preserve things. And so I'm hopeful that we can, you know, uh, pivot in that direction when we get back to to doing things out there. Marianne Hillis, can I get your perspective on that? Yeah, I think that also if this has uh, taught us something is that um, science matter and we need scientists. And so I think this is, uh, we need more people to keep on what we're doing. And I think because this kind of knowledge is what is gonna help us get out of the hole, if you wanna put it like that. Um, I think what we do at the academy, um, with the collections, we're trying to understand the natural world, we're trying to understand the evolution, um, and all of this is just to under to try to protect this biodiversity, because by affecting biodiversity, habitat loss, degradation, uh, deforestation, we are making ourselves more prone to this kind of, of diseases and, and this kind of, of problems. We also need to keep on the knowledge about nature because otherwise this is gonna be like, if, if there was no uh, science or evidence into like bats are not evil. So people will just get crazy and start killing all the bats and bats are pollinators. And then, so we have a, a chain reaction there. So I think this is showing us that science matter and that we need to keep uh, the, the new generations, we need scientists in this new uh, uh, generations. And of course, we're gonna have to maybe modify some ways that we do things temporarily, I hope. Um, but there is so much data in all the collections that we can still have work for ever, I think, if, if, we, if it was that we never will be able to go back to the field, which I don't think is gonna happen. Um, but, uh, but I just think this is just a lesson of how we have to, we have to keep on with science. Jason, your closing thoughts to this point. Yeah, so I mean, it depends on whether you're talking about undergrad students and grad students. I mean, what my grad students have been doing is that they have been able to analyze a lot of data. So we, we were lucky that we sort of had an influx of data that came in during this time and we were able to remotely actually um, get into computers to analyze it, um, you know, and I agree with everything that, that Marianne Hillis has just said. Um, you know, the importance of being able to do this kind of work is there. And I think, um, you know, hopefully we can, you know, the world sees the importance of, of science in the end, uh, in the end of all this. Um, I also, you know, I like the point that Rick made about co-ops. One of my undergrads in the midst of all of this craziness was offered four jobs <laughs> upon graduating. So, you know, these are all, lab oriented science jobs, but to be able to get a job when things are in this situation is pretty impressive. So, you know, she's, she's a superstar. So, you know, but it still boggles my mind that she was able to get a job in a downturn like this. So I want to remind people you've been listening to COVID calls. I want to be sure to thank Jane Taylor and Roland Wall and Scott Cooper for helping to make this conversation possible today. And I want to thank my guests, Jason Weckstein and Rick McCourt and Marianne Hillis Arce for joining me on COVID calls to talk today about uh, biodiversity and COVID-19. And I learned a ton. Who could imagine hanging out with three scientists? You're going to learn a lot, right? Every time. It's just tremendous. And I want to remind everybody that you can tune in on COVID calls um, every weekday, Monday through Friday, right here at five o'clock Eastern time. Thank you all three so much for sharing your knowledge in this hour. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Scott. It was fun. Stay, stay healthy, everyone. See you, you tomorrow. Too. <laughs> you too. Yeah. Bye.